pit on a sandbar in the San Jacinto River. Unfortunately, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act had not yet passed, and regulations for disposal of the docks and waste from paper mills were not yet developed. If these regulations had been in place, the waste would not have been dumped where they were, and the Superfund site would not have to be created. Now that the San Jacinto River has reclaimed that sandbar, the contamination is widespread and cleanup will be very costly. Harris County officials and the EPA have been working hard to ensure that taxpayers don't bear the cost of that cleanup, and they're continuing the fight. Proper waste regulations could have avoided these cleanup costs and these litigation costs and could have protected the people of our district. With that, I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, again for appearing today, and particularly thank Wendy New and Vince Ryan, who are appearing for a very short notice. Uh, Mr. Ryan is our Harris County attorney, and his office has worked diligently on the San Jacinto Waste Pits for several years. And I know the Houston area and our district particularly appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you, and I appreciate the uh, first hearing. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Green. And now I'd like to recognize uh, um, Chairman Emeritus Barton for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll <clears throat> submit the full statement for the record. I want to thank our witnesses for attending today's hearing. Uh, your subcommittee, Mr. Chairman, is the third subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee to hold a hearing on the uh, promulgation of uh, regulations and the econ economic impact that those regulations have on our economy. Uh, we have heard from the um, Environmental Protection Agency and the Office of Regulatory Affairs of the Obama administration at the other two subcommittees. Today we're going to hear from the private sector uh, and see how these regulations impact uh, the economies in, in their parts of the country. Uh, unemployment is over 9 percent, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the mantra on both sides of the aisle is jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, the Obama administration says that they, uh, they want their regulations to pass some sort of a cost-benefit analysis, but we know, uh, especially at the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, that they tend to pay only lip service to that. So. In today's hearing, I'm sure we're going to hear from the private sector uh, how those regulations impact them, uh, and we're also going to hear probably some, um, some good input on what kind of a cost-benefit and economic analysis should be done. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back, and I look forward to your chairmanship of this, uh, this vital subcommittee. Gentlemen, the yields back is time now. The chair recognizes the chairman of full committee, Mr. Upton from Michigan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I'm a moment late from being downstairs. Uh, this is an important hearing. Your testimony is crucial to helping us understand what improvements are needed in the regulatory process to ensure that it allows for economic prosperity. Test. Somehow, we have lost our way. <laughs> Those small businesses and manufacturers who should be driving our economic recovery are choking from burdensome red tape, weathering an agency-wide regulatory epidemic that seems bent on accomplishment, accomplishing a single-minded purpose without regard to fixing the economy and protecting jobs, not to mention environmental regs also substantially raise costs on the public sector, and these costs are not easily absorbed. Just this past December, EPA published guidelines for preparing economic analysis. This document is to, is to govern EPA's regulatory actions. It states, quote, regulatory induced employment impacts are not in general relevant to the benefit cost analysis, end quote. The bureaucratic insensitivity towards those folks in Michigan and across the nation who are struggling to make ends meet is stunning. It is guidelines like this that have catapulted the country into a perpetual state of soaring unemployment and economic uncertainty. The time has come to stop the, asking the American family, the American small business, the innovators, and the risk takers to bear any burden and pay any price. Many of our constituents who are struggling to compete in this tough economy say that government regs are like a piano on their back. Despite executive orders from a number of presidents calling for economic impact analyses or job impact analyses, the relief never seems to come. We have to focus the government on serving the people instead of ham hamstringing them. Mr. Chairman, these values and principles should drive the president in all federal agencies. 
No one here today is saying don't regulate. We are simply saying regulate only when the good it will accomplish clearly outweighs the harm. Today's hearing is a positive step forward on that journey to help the executive branch develop a conscience and an understanding about the impact on the economy and jobs and families for every regulation it pursues. So let's get going. Thank you. Yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. I will recognize Mr. Gardner from Colorado for 30 seconds. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the short time that I have been in this Congress, I have had an incredible number of people come into my office and talk about the effect that regulations have or may have on their business. Our country is still fighting its way out of a recession, and our government's response many times seems to be adding more handcuff handcuffs than solutions. We have got an obligation to our environment, to our children and future generations, but it is time we do so in a common sense way driven by the interests of the people and not the special interests. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, if the Chairman Emeritus, you know, we only have 30 seconds left, I will give you a chance to get sit situated and then we will let Kathy McMorris Rogers for 30 seconds. You are recognized right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank you for holding this important hearing, and I thank all the witnesses for taking time out of their schedules to be here. I wanted to give a special welcome, welcome to Joe Baird, President of the Northwest Mining Association, for being here today. You know, despite effective safeguards, the EPA has decided that it needs to step in and add regulations that will all but certain drain the mining industry of its capital, making us more dependent upon other countries for important minerals. I mentioned on the floor last week this is not what America is about, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on how we can keep the dream alive. I thank the gentlewoman, and now I recognize Chairman Emeritus, uh, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing is entitled Environmental Regulations, the Economy and Jobs. I think this is a worthy topic for discussion if we do it right. Unfortunately, I'm concerned that today's hearing may simply be a platform for complaints about our landmark laws designed to protect taxpayers and the public health. We will hear complaints about Superfund, the Resource, Resources Conservation and Recovery Act, the Toxic Substances Control Act. We will hear complaints about laws outside of this subcommittee's jurisdiction like the Clean Air Act. The environmental laws we will discuss today form the cornerstone of public health protections. Before Superfund and RICRA, there was Love Canal, a New York neighborhood built atop thousands of tons of toxic waste carelessly disposed of in a ditch. Before the Safe Drinking Water Act, the American public had no assurances that the water coming from their tap was free of cancer-causing chemicals and dangerous bacteria. Today we will hear precious little about the benefits of protecting the public health from these toxic exposures. Instead, the subcommittee is likely to focus solely on the economic costs of environmental regulations. I have no objection to discussing the economics of environmental regulation, but any fair and balanced discussion should include both sides of the equation, the economic benefits as well as the costs. Environmental regulations protect the economy as well as society from the devastating cost of pollution. In the absence of sound regulation, when polluters are allowed to pollute, the costs of that pollution don't simply disappear. Instead, innocent parties have to pick up the tab. Our health care system has to bear the weight of asthmatic children and more adults with cancer. Businesses have to absorb the costs of employees who miss work due to chronic illness. Municipalities have to cover the costs of cleaning up toxic pollution before it reaches drinking water supplies. Environmental regulations protect the public from these impacts. They can also spur economic growth and job creation. Expenditures for environmental compliance spur investment in the design, manufacture, installation and operation of equipment to reduce pollution. EPA recently estimated that the Clean Air Act's total benefit to the economy is projected to hit $2 trillion by 2020, outweighing costs by 30 to 1. It is a tenet of our society that we hold people accountable for their actions, and that we offer protection to those who can't protect themselves. When a coal-burning power plant fails to invest in new pollution control equipment to reduce its toxic mercury emissions, it damages the way our children think and learn. That's why the responsible party, in this case the coal plant, 
has an obligation to control its emissions. As I've said previously, let's put aside the false and hyperbolic claims about regulations killing jobs. No one supports unnecessary or duplicative regulations, but let's also not hesitate to regulate where needed to protect our economy and public health. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back the time. And I thank the Chairman Emeritus. Uh, now I, I'd ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee have five legislative days to submit opening statements for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Now I'd like to welcome our first panel, uh, and you'll be recognized for five minutes. Your full statement will be submitted for the record. Uh, if you can uh, do uh, you know, a brief executive summary, and then we'll go into questions. I'd like to first, uh, and I want to thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to first uh, recognize Randall, is it Lutter? Lutter, PhD, visiting scholar from Resources for the Future. Uh, sir, you're, um, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee. I'm pleased to appear today to offer my views on environmental regulation, the economy, and jobs, an important topic because both the environment and- Sir, if you could just pull your mic down a little bit thank further. You are important to Americans. As an economist, I believe that careful analysis of the effects of regulations can help in designing regulations to offer clear net benefits to Americans and to avoid unnecessary burdens. Careful regulatory analysis can also help promote both public understanding of regulatory decisions and accountability for the regulators. I speak as an economist who's been involved in regulatory policy for more than two decades. I've had the privilege of serving Democratic and Republican presidents, including positions at the Federal Office of Management and Budget, the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and the Food and Drug Administration. I'm currently visiting scholar at Resources for the Future, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that conducts independent research on environmental energy, natural resource, and environmental health issues. I've conducted research at the American Enterprise Institute and the AEI Brookings Joint Center for Regulatory Studies. I have no conflicts of interest to report, and I emphasize that the views I present today are mine alone. RFF takes no institutional position on legislative, judicial, regulatory, or other public policy matters. An important concern these days is employment. The commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics recently announced the unemployment rate declined from 9.4 to 9 percent in January. Non-farm employment, now about a million, over the low of a year ago is 7.7 .7 million below the highest level of the last decade, nearly 138 million jobs. Thus, non-farm employment needs strong and sustained growth to match levels seen before the recent recession. Cyclical trends in employment and unemployment are, however, a macroeconomic phenomenon best addressed through fiscal and monetary policy and sound financial regulation, topics beyond my scope today. The consensus view among economists about the role of economic analysis and environmental regulation is that it's an exceptionally useful framework for consistently organizing disparate information and in this way can greatly improve the process and the outcome of policy analysis and deliberations. This idea has become part of a centralized process of regulatory review outlined in Executive Order 12866, which President Clinton issued in 93, replacing an earlier executive order of comparable scope signed by President Reagan. Executive Order 12866 does not mention employment or jobs in its 12 principles, but it directs agencies to conduct an assessment, including the underlying analysis of costs anticipated from the regulatory action, such as any adverse effects on the efficient functioning of the economy, including productivity, employment, and competitiveness. President Obama's uh, January 18th Executive Order uh, 13563 on improving regulation and regulatory review reaffirms the earlier one and mentions the promotion of job creation under general principles. I turn to how the Environmental Protection Agency has analyzed and considered possible effects of its regulations on employment. I've looked at several regulatory impact analyses of proposed major rules recently released by the agency and found a variety of practices. For two regulations, coal combustion and ozone, uh, EPA uh, provided no information and no explanation for the lack of analysis. One of these, a proposed standard for ozone, is very likely to have adverse effects on local, local labor markets because of the difficulty of achieving cuts in emissions of 90 percent or greater. EPA has estimated positive but statistically insignificant effects on employment for one regulation, the industrial boilers, and modest negative effects for another, Portland cement. Evaluating these different approaches to employment effects is difficult because OMB's guidance implementing Executive Order 12866 does so little to clarify how agencies should assess effects on employment. 
Recently, however, EPA has released a, a new guidance on this issue. My own recommendations, uh, regulatory agencies first should issue regulations only where the benefits demonstrably justify the costs, and they should take full advantage of statutory authority to use market-based regulatory mechanisms. In addition, the Office of Management and Budget should issue an addendum to A4 about how agencies should analyze effects of regulations on employment, but only after soliciting and considering public comment and genuinely independent expert advice. The focus of such guidelines should be on identifying what employment effects can be quantified reliably and what quantification procedures are appropriate, and the guidelines should reconsider excluding from benefit cost analysis the cost of job losses induced by regulations. The guidelines should also provide for distributional analyses of effects on those workers who are at significant incremental risk of job loss and who face barriers to finding another job. I understand my written testimony will be part of the record and I'll, of course, available for questions. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Lutter. Um, now I'd like to recognize Ms. Um, Karen Harned, uh, Executive Director, NFIB Legal Center. Uh, welcome and you have five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Shemkos and Ranking Member Green. NFIB, the nation's largest small business advocacy organization, appreciates the opportunity to testify <clears throat> on the importance of assessing small business impact in the regulatory process. Overzealous regulation is a perennial cause of concern for small business owners and is particularly burdensome in times like these when the nation's economy remains sluggish. According to a recent study, regulation costs the American economy $1.75 trillion a year. More concerning, small businesses face an annual regulatory cost of $10,585 per employee, 36 percent more than the regulatory cost facing businesses with more than 500 employees. Job growth in America remains stagnant. Although small businesses create two-thirds of the net new jobs in this country, the NFIB Research Foundation's most recent edition of Small Business Economic Trends revealed in the next three months 12 percent of respondents plan to increase employment while 8 percent plan a reduction in workforce. Small business owners consistently cite government regulation as one of their primary problems in running their business. In its most recent edition of SBET, the NFIB Research Foundation found that 17 percent of small business owners describe government regulations and red tape to be their single most important problem. Only taxes and poor sales were more commonly cited. In fact, for the past 26 months of the survey, regulation and red tape has been in the top three of problems. This is not a recent trend either. NFIB surveys demonstrate that overzealous government regulation has ranked in the top 10 of problems facing small businesses since 1991. Reducing the regulatory burden will go a long way toward giving entrepreneurs the confidence they need to expand their workforce in a meaningful way. Recently, the administration acknowledged that excessive and duplicative regulation has a damaging effect on the American economy. NFIB believes that it has been a long time coming for small business owners to hear the administration emphasize the harmful effects of overregulation on small business and job creation. We will be watching closely to see if last month's directive leads to real regulatory reform. Moreover, NFIB hopes that the President's order causes agencies to more closely follow the letter and spirit of the Administrative Procedures Act. When agencies do not follow the procedures of the APA, they frequently enact one-size-fits-all rules that are not sensitive to the unique circumstances of small businesses. An important tool in the arsenal to ensure that federal regulations are developed in a way that considers small business impact is the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement and Fairness Act. Sabrifa so requires federal agencies to analyze the impact of proposed regulations on small firms and as a result gives small businesses a voice in the federal rulemaking process. Sabrifa, so when followed correctly, can be a valuable instrument for agencies to identify flexible and less burdensome regulatory alternatives. Sabrifa so and its associated processes processes such as the Small Business Advocacy Review Panels are important ways for agencies to understand how small businesses fundamentally operate, how the regulatory burden disproportionately impacts small business, and how the agency can develop simple and concise guidance materials. 
While SBREFA itself is a good first step, in order for it to provide the regulatory relief that Congress intended, the agencies must make good faith efforts to comply with it. By following the letter and spirit of SBREFA, agencies like EPA would avoid many of the unnecessary burdens and costs of regulations small businesses experience. Unfortunately for small businesses, however, through the years, a number of EPA regulations have failed to account for the unique characteristics of small business. For example, EPA's lead-based pay, lead paint renovation, repair, and painting rule has been problematic for small businesses that engage in renovation and construction work. The rule requires small businesses to pay for, extensive, for expensive certification and training for each of their employees. Certification begins at $304 for renovators and $550 for painting activities or both painting and renovating. Co fees could cost thousands of dollars per firm depending on the number of employees they have. Although Superfund was enacted in 1980, NFIB has heard from members with businesses that have been named as a potentially responsible responsible party in a third-party lawsuit. They have been forced to spend thousands of dollars in an excessive amount of time defending themselves when they did nothing wrong or illegal or do not have the records to prove their innocence. When EPA and other agencies follow the procedures for evaluating small business impact of regulations before they are promulgated, it is a win-win for the economy, the public, and small business. Thank you for holding this important hearing. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Harnett. And for my colleagues, I'm going to try to get both opening statements done prior to they just called votes. I think we can get both in. Um, if I gavel you, it will be for that for our ability to hear. But uh, that's just for information for my colleagues. Uh, not, next, I'd like to uh, recognize Mr. Christopher DeMuth, D.C. Senior, Searle Senior Fellow, American Enterprise Institute. Sir, you have five minutes. Uh, there is a button there. The committee, thank you for having me here today. And in light of the time, I will give a brief opening statement. Environmental policy and employment policy are two uh, central concerns. Uh, Americans like high levels of clean air and water, and they like high levels of unemployment. These two values uh, uh, sometimes clash, uh, and they are clashing uh, today. To the economist, uh, taking jobs as the metric of the costs of environmental policy is a little bit crude. It's certainly important to the elected representative. It's what uh, the general public cares about. But one can imagine a good environmental rule that had negative employment effects, and one can imagine and sometimes sees bad environmental rules that have positive uh, 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 employment effects. When we regulate, we are buying something, cleaner air and water. Uh, just like everything we buy privately, it has a cost. And the costs can be higher prices, or they can be less good product quality, uh, or they can be lower uh, employment. The question of whether it's a good uh, rule or not uh, is, uh, is a larger one than the one of employment. In general, environmental regulation has been a great success story uh, for America. It has had very large... Uh, economic benefits since our first modern statutes were passed in the early 1980s. But we know now that it has been uh, much less cost effective than it could have been. We could have gotten much more environmental improvements for the money we've spent, or we could have gotten the same amount of environmental improvements for vastly less, less money, uh, or a little bit of both. Um, there's evidence that uh, EPA regulations have, have been becoming uh, less cost-effective over time uh, following the huge uh, improvements that were gained in the 1970s. There's a wide variation in the effectiveness of different uh, statutes, and we could revise the statutes to get much uh, more environmental gains and much fewer costs of the kind the committee is worried about. In my view, the reasons for the problems uh, that uh, the committee, your subcommittee, is focusing on today are two. The first is that environmental, uh, uh, that regulatory costs are off budget. Uh, EPA's budget is a tiny sliver of the billions of dollars of costs that it rules, that its rules impose, but it does not have uh, natural incentives to economize on those costs. They're not costs to the agency. They're costs to the private sector or municipalities or schools uh, or whatever. Uh, uh, the costs are relatively uh, insensible to the public. They take the form of higher prices or plants that aren't built or sometimes 
plants that are shut down. Uh, uh, and uh, as a result, uh, agencies often go uh, too far. Uh, the regulatory agency will get a 90 percent elimination of some risk or pollution level. It'll then want to go for another 8 percent, and it'll then want to go for 1.5 percent, and it will keep pushing and pushing. The laws are being made by single-purpose agencies operating largely without a, a budget constraint, and their incentive will be to push until the hue and cry becomes so great, such as from the uh, Congress, uh, that, they, uh, that they back off. Uh, the secondly, second is the very wide uh, delegation that the Congress gives in many environmental statutes so that the really tough choices are made by the agencies. The specialized agency goes back over a, uh, over a century. Uh, uh, EPA is a classic uh, example of it. The original idea was expertise, and certainly there are many areas of uh, pollution control that are highly uh, technical. Uh, and that uh, technicians can handle better than generalist legislators. But as the controversies before this committee today illustrate, uh, these are not merely technical questions. They're highly important political and economic ones. But we have gotten ourselves into a situation where the legislator can vote for clean air and clean water and leave the hard and contentious uh, decision-making to uh, the agencies and then criticize uh, after the fact. Uh, and uh, the agencies will, in this situation, often go too far until they are uh, criticized. There are two proposals, as I understand it, uh, before the Congress today for general regulatory reform. Uh, they are addressed to the two problems I have identified. Uh, Senator Warner is working on a proposal that would put the agencies on a budget of the expenditures that their rules force. Uh, it's a sort of a pay-go idea where to issue a new regulation, you'd have to eliminate some old ones. That's, a t that's addressed to the problem of uh, unbudgeted, uh, off-budget costs. Uh, the uh, so-called RAINS Act, uh, introduced by Congressman Jeff Davis and now introduced in the Senate by uh, uh, Senator uh, DeMint, uh, is, an, is the proposal for Congress to take back uh, some considerable degree of the discretion it has uh, delegated to the agencies. My, testimo my testimony says some good things and identifies some problems with both approaches. In my view, uh, neither of them would be as worthwhile as the Congress's returning to many areas of the uh, environmental statutes where it has delegated too much and where much more specific standards uh, could resolve some of the problems that we're facing today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. DeMuth. Now I would like to turn to Ms. Rena Steinthor, President of the Center for Progressive Regulation at the University of Maryland School of Law. Welcome. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the mistaken belief that environmental protection kills jobs. No matter how many times this fatally flawed argument is repeated, empirical evidence supporting the claim is scant and not credible. Instead, the evidence shows that environmental regulations save lives, preserve irreplaceable natural resources, and not incidentally create jobs. In fact, if we pull the camera back and look at the economy as a whole, the primary cause of the economic recession and its devastating effect on jobs is under-regulation, not over-regulation. Everything from the TARP bailouts to the underwater mortgage crisis can be traced back to excessive corporate corner cutting unchecked by an effective regulatory system. Too often, regulatory costs are envisioned as putting money in a pile and setting it on fire. Environmental protections reduce health care and preserve resources for future generations. Not incidentally, taking the remedial steps that they require, especially when capital investments are involved, creates jobs. Pollution control equipment must be designed, manufactured, and installed. People must be hired to construct and operate highly engineered landfills that can safely contain hazardous waste and treat sewage and drinking water. Even if we restrict the analysis of regulatory impacts to monetary investments and do not consider the ethics of preserving life, health, and nature, the money that is not spent treating cancer
<laughs> I'd like to call the hearing back. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues for coming back uh, expeditiously. It's a pretty quick turnaround. And, and now uh, yes. we'll go into the five-minute questions. Most members are still making their way back or trying to grab a sandwich. So I'm sure a few more will show up by... Mm -hmm. Um, by the time, but I'll recognize myself for uh, five minutes. The um, first, I'd like for Dr. Um, Lutter. Uh, you cited a breathtaking statement by EPA in June 10th. In fact, I have it right here, along with a December statement of EPA analysis. Uh, in this, uh, in your statement, in which you're quoting uh, the EPA uh, when it put out a proposed rule for combustion byproducts under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. EPA said, um, and I quote, the regulatory impact analysis for this proposed rule does not include either qualitative or quantitative estimates of potential effects on economic productivity, economic growth, employment, job creation, <coughs> or international competitiveness. Do you believe that they uh, uh, comment on this statement, and, and, and do you believe they should put that as part of the uh, analysis? First of all, I think they should be commended for full disclosure. But um, more, more importantly, I think they should have done more analysis on that. Um, and I think what's interesting is exactly with respect to uh, the employment effects, that employment is clearly recognized under the executive order. As, as um, uh, Chris Demuth has pointed out, employment effects are not necessarily costs, but it's um, important, especially in this environment, for, for um, the decision makers to t be aware of that and also for the public to be aware of employment effects. And, and I think a reasonable economic analysis, especially of a regulation of that magnitude, should have taken into account um, 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 employment effects. I'm not a specialist in that rule, but that rule is a, a, a rule of several billion dollars. Thank you. Ms. Harnett, and uh, I don't even know, my first term, my second term, I worked with the NFIB closely to get liability relief from small businesses and superman obligations as being um, one of the primary responsible parties then went after the smaller guys mm -hmm. uh, who weren't really involved other than they, you know, they used a municipal landfill in this case, like everyone else, but of course two or two industries um, used it with hazardous material and then they got pulled in. Um, it's under your belief that uh, regulation should have an analysis of economic impact on jobs. Uh, wouldn't you agree? Yes, and um, that's the Superfund example. I think is a good one of um, of that, and just also the key that the NFIB has seen with with our members and regulation generally, which is. When you talk about unintended consequences, typically you're talking about what happens with the regulation to the members I represent, the small business owners I represent. And I don't think when, I would assume when Superfund was enacted, nobody thought that we were going to have members letting us know that it's, they spent $43,000 to get them out of litigation that they shouldn't even have been in to begin with. And so doing that work on the front end can help prevent those unintended consequences and can help make sure that small business owners have the certainty they need going forward so that they can hire. And we, and we may follow up on a whole separate Superfund hearing because of the cost of litigation versus cost of recovery. Some of the states do a much better job because they're not tied into the morass of, of litigation. Uh, Dr. Uh, DeMuth, do less expensive environmental federal regulations necessarily mean less environmental protection? Uh, no, it's easy to posit a case where a stricter rule will result in less pollution, but we have a lot of cases where uh, EPA has uh, found ways to reduce the costs of its regulation that have actually increased the effectiveness. One example would be the lead phase-down regulations, uh, which in addition to, which accelerated the withdrawal of lead additives from the gasoline supply. Uh, at the time it put those rules in place, it put in place a, a trading system so that uh, 
uh, gasoline refiners that had more refining capacity could substitute lead at a faster rate than those with lesser and uh, make trades among themselves. Uh, that's been a pretty well studied example of how uh, it, we reduced the costs of compliance and greatly uh, accelerated the removal of lead from the gasoline supply by harnessing market incentives to the EPA rules. And I, I think my clock got all messed up, so I don't know how much time, and I want to be respectful of my colleagues. I just want to make sure we put in the record the uh, guidelines for preparing economic analysis by the EPA de uh, December 2010, just a statement. I don't want to put the whole in 9.2.3.3 impacts on employment. I quote, regulatory induced employment impacts are not in general relevant for, for a benefit cost analysis. For most situations, employment impacts should not be included in the formal benefit cost analysis. And I think that's part of the reason why we're having this hearing, because many of us will say it should. Um, and then I'd like to, now my time's expired, I'd like to recognize my colleague on the screen from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Letter, uh, your years, you, said, you also said that you had worked, for, worked as a, at OMB. Yes, sir. It seems like I recall having dealt with over the last many years uh, with agencies and their regulations that oftentimes their regulations are submitted to OMB for whether we call it benefit analysis or it's a comment before it actually takes effect. Is that true? Uh, that has been the case for many years, yes, sir. Okay. Do you know if OMB does any cost-benefit analysis that may be separate from the individual agency? Well, historically it doesn't. It, do, it offers comment on the agency's economic analyses, the, their benefit cost analyses, and other related analyses, all required by the executive order. Those comments are typically taken seriously by the agency that then revises the economic analysis to, t to, to reflect the OMB comments. But there's not a separate, EPA, a separate OMB analysis except to improve the, the, the analysis of the agency. But there is an analysis, there is an oversight of the agency, whether it be EPA, EPA or Department of Labor or any other agency, that OMB would actually uh, look at their economic analysis. There, there is oversight. The magnitude of the change is, it depends on the circumstances. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we've heard from our Republican colleagues that regulations designed to protect the environment and public health may cost too much and they all have been ignored by the other side of the equation, the cost of not taking action to protect the environment and public health. Last year, the Office of Management and Budget estimated the major federal regulations over the last 10 years cost between 43 and $55 billion. Uh, Ms. Steinzor, does that cost tell the whole story? No, thank you for asking that question. It doesn't because it ignores the benefits of uh, regulation, and that's a very important part of this equation. Regulation does help create jobs because the money is being channeled back into the economy. It's not being destroyed. So um, that's one of the reasons why we're emphasizing um, competitive energy policies that will put us ahead in global competition because uh, forcing us to stop using um, polluting okay. materials will be very helpful. I appreciate it. Ms. Lutter, do you agree that the balanced discussion of the cost of regulation should include a discussion of the benefits too? Yes. Okay. Um, OMB estimated that the economic benefits of major regulations over the last 10 years found tremendous benefits up to $616 billion. Uh, the benefits uh, oftentimes outweighed the cost three to one and sometimes as much as 12 to one. But these uh, hard numbers don't tell, I think, the human side of the story. And I think uh, Mr. Demurth talked about the reasonableness of taking lead out of gasoline. And there was uh, a reasonable regulation to be able to trade and to deal with it. I don't think any of us would want to go back to what, because there are a lot of countries in the world that still have lead in their gasoline. Uh, but uh, that was probably one that ultimately paid off much better. Uh, and, and frankly, it sounds like from your testimony, it was, it was work more workable than some of the ones we may see, again, through lots of different administrations. Um, Ms. Steinzor, uh, it may be tempting to, to some to rely on a clinical cost estimate as a form 
and justify policy. Do you think it makes sense to rely on analytical tools alone, or do we need to remain cognizant of the other principles of our society, like fairness and justice and equity? Yes, sir, and I actually think that Congress did a terrific job on that when it wrote the Clean Air Act and the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Toxic Substances Control Act. All of those statutes talk about protecting human health and the environment with an ample, adequate margin of safety. Um, those are the kind of phrases that you used, and I would just, um, until you change your instructions to the agencies, that's what they're going to be following. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, one last uh, question in my last 20 seconds. Typically, agency rules, uh, industries have the right to go to the courthouse and file, uh, whether it be the NFIB or, or individual affected industries. Uh, don't you think that is also a check? And, and I guess let me ask uh, Ms. Harnell, if, uh, if the NFIB actually ever filed in court representing a certain part of the industry uh, on some regulation you thought uh, was, was maybe not proper. Right. We've done that on um, a, a several occasions um, with EPA, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and um, I think a couple of other agencies. All of these um, issues that we were raising were, you know, uh, checking the administration for not following Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act. The good thing is, is we have that as a tool. The bad news is, is in, um, you know, the case where we, the court agreed with us, the appeals court ultimately agreed with us, um, our members never saw any relief. They just told the agency, you know, don't do it again, basically. So the rule never got... Did the got, agency overrule that? Uh, did the uh, court overrule the agency? They said they, they did not provide, um, they did not tell the agency to go back and fix the problem. They just said don't do it again. So I guess my point is, is they acknowledged that the agency didn't follow its procedures and that that was in violation of the law, but they did not go back and and fix the issue that we were complaining about fundamentally, which was a streamlined process that had been taken away from small business owners for permitting. Thank you. Gentlemen's time's expired. I, I would just weigh in in, in that uh, there's litigation costs that have to then be borne by the small business to, to even go through that process. I'd like to yield uh, five minutes to my colleague from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all very much for your testimony today. Um, one of the things about this that bothers me the most is I, and some of you touched on it in your testimony, and that is that Congress does seem to be ceding more and more authority to regulatory bodies, particularly by writing pieces of legislation that are very vague, and, and it lends itself to interpretations by the way that people want to interpret it. An example of that, I think Mr. DeMuth pointed this out in his testimony, was on the TARP legislation. Uh, we thought they were going to be buying toxic assets with some of these public funds instead of they were making equity investments in financial.
efficiency, even at the detriment of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of costs and compliance costs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Chair, recognize the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Harper, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate each of you being here and uh, shedding some light on this. <clears throat> and uh, I can only tell you uh, that I, I can't find a business or an industry in my district uh, that thinks that they're under-regulated. And uh, so we, uh, we have to deal with those issues on a regular basis and trying to uh, find that uh, proper balance is something that I hope that we can do in this, in this Congress. And a question I would have for you, Mr. DeMuth, is um, uh, are you concerned that by proposing the use of performance standards that you're actually encouraging the federal government to, to dictate the means of production or investment um, and manufacturing in this country? Uh, a performance standard, uh, in my understanding, is a standard that says this is the amount of pollution we're going to permit. And I generally think that that is superior to a technology standard that says this is the way you're going to manufacture tires. Or this is, you know. Uh, so, in general, I think that performance standards involve less dictation to businesses about how they will meet pollution. Uh, obligations and have more and have more flexibility. There are cases where I think that the advantages of performance standards uh, outweigh this, but in many, many more cases than we permit today, I would think that moving to performance standards would be a step in the right direction. When you're looking at the environmental standards that or statutes that are in place, uh, what comes to the top of your list on what most needs to be reformed? If you had to identify a couple that, uh, that you think are, are definitely in need. Uh, I would say in the jurisdiction of this committee, uh, the uh, RICRA and uh, Superfund statutes, uh, I think that they've been, uh, they produce some good, RICRA's definitely produced some good things. Uh, together, I think they've been woefully inefficient. Uh, I think probably the worst uh, environmental statute is outside of your jurisdiction, and that is the National Ambient Air Quality Standards portion of the Clean Air Act uh, with all of the state implementation plans. Uh, there's an enormous amount of waste and inefficiency simply in the administration of this program. Uh, and if you compare it to uh, automobile pollution standards, uh, what Congress has done directly in the acid rain and ozone standards, uh, uh, where we had Congress itself making a decision, reflecting the consensus of our representatives as to what the standard was going to be and how fast we were going to, uh, to pursue it, I think those have been much more, uh, much more effective. And if you go back to 1970, you can see why people were interested in this state implementation plan approach, but it's become a bureaucratic uh, quag quagmire, and it's not doing anything good for the economy or the environment. Or not, not it, it could be doing much more. And I'd love to have your take on how you view the large federal deficits and amount of federal spending, what impact you're seeing that have in, in your view on businesses in this country. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's a powerful uh, suppressant uh, to uh, business, uh, business investment uh, because it creates uh, the idea that our national government itself uh, will be uh, at risk, that uh, our borrowing will be uh, downgraded. Uh, uh, these are things that a lot of business people take seriously, and uh, it, it leaves them like, like consumers wondering about our future and uh, making them much less likely to make large capital investments. Thank you. Yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Chair recognizing that recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Cassidy, for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Steinzor, am I pronouncing that correctly? I came in yeah. late. Um, you know a heck of a lot more than I do about this. Uh, and I'm actually going to go just for the, to explore the theoretical, um, which is not under our jurisdiction. I'm going to speak about Clean Air Act, but I'm just interested in picking your brain. Because I kind of agree with these folks, so I learn, if you will, from you whom I may agree or disagree. Clearly, the elephant in the room of our economy is whether or not CO2 and greenhouse gases are going to be regulated. Of incredible concern to my district uh, from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Lots of people with good jobs and good benefits are employed in these industries. As I read about the cap-and-trade bill, 
one thing that they said was almost inevitable, there'd be carbon leakage. People would just move their carbon intensive enterprises to another country, losing the jobs, just shipping the jobs overseas, but still emitting the greenhouse gas, just accepting for the sake of argument that this is a concern. I'm, you know. And then I think I recently saw a big steel plant out of Spain re relocated, just shut down. When I asked why, they said, well, heck, they just sold their credits. It was easier for them to move their carbon intensive or energy intensive enterprise elsewhere than to put up with the regulations. And I'm thinking as I look at Spain's fiscal mess, wow, maybe this contributed to the fiscal mess. So in the theoretical, where a regulation or a regulatory environment comes in and says, thou shalt, and the easiest way to comply is to say adios and to move down to some place where they speak Spanish or Chinese or uh, uh, you name it. It, it, regulation doesn't kill jobs in that regard. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, it just seems like there's this exodus of jobs related to this sort of regulation. So again, it's not under our jurisdiction, but, but I figured that could be the basis of kind of, if you will, a theoretical conversation with you. Um, I would um, point to perhaps the most devastating event in your state, which would be the Deepwater Horizon spill. Now, if I may, re, re, if I may, uh, I think you point out correctly that the problems there is not the absence of regulation, but a dysfunctional regulatory em environment. And I would also point out that ongoing, we have a jobs moratorium now because they can't, although with resources, they can't pull their regulatory environment together. So a lot of people who depend upon these jobs for their mortgages can't get work. I'm sorry, I, that just touches a button in me because I know so many families that are connected by this kind of heavy hand of government destroying their ability to work and support their families. I'm sorry. <laughs> Continue. Well, uh, I have lots of compassion for those people, too, and I would suggest to you that the entity that cost them the jobs was British Petroleum in cooperation with Transocean and Halliburton. Now, that is to imply, though, that the other actors out there, Chevron, Exxon Mobil, you name it, are doing the same sort of bad behavior as BP. There's no evidence for that. Indeed, the National Academy of Engineers said that the problems of the Macondo well were identifiable and fixable, and that the moratorium would not appreciably increase safety. So we've got thousands of people out of, say, out of work because one bad actor uh, is, th that's being ascribed to everybody else. Well, I, I think the moratorium was lifted, but I think what my point was, and the Oil Spill Commission certainly concluded this, that there are systemic problems throughout the whole industry, but if we were to just look at British Petroleum in isolation, it had profits of 19 and $17 billion. Now, I'm not putting, now years. believe me, we can agree. I knew we'd have common ground. We can put BP on the dock and we're going to both, we're going to both be in agreement. My concern isn't about oh, B <laughs> yeah, BP as a bad actor, about the fact that good actors are now being penalized because a regulatory environment can't, and people are losing jobs. I mean, jobs, they got rigs moving to the coast of Africa uh, with the jobs that go with it because a regulatory environment will not get off bottom center to allow good actors to again begin to work. Now, to me, that just seems a total kind of tyranny of the regulator. Well, again, uh, we have 55 inspectors in the Gulf of Mexico to inspect 3,500 oil rigs and production platforms. So um, I am not going to lay a bet that there won't be another spill. But if we look at countries that don't have any regulation, they do play, pay an incredible price. I mean, there's an article in the British Medical Journal, The Lancet. I am not at all, excuse me, just because I have limited time, I'm not saying don't regulate. I'm just saying I see the tyranny of the regulator right now who always shifts it so that you can never quite get your permit and that the people who depend upon those jobs don't have their jobs with the salary and the benefits. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't think those 55 inspectors are feeling particularly tyrannical and that the big economic cost in, uh, to Louisiana was um, unregulated industry that uh, really was careless, negligent, 
um, was making outrageous profits and uh, squandered the economic and natural health of the whole Louisiana coast. If I may say, I would say it was not, it was a single actor, BP, if I may finish, uh, it was a single actor called BP, years. Um, this was not a, uh, the problems were fixable and definite and lasted a fin up, it's not the 55, frankly, it's Brown, Witch, and Salazar. So at some point, they become a translator of someone who decides to otherwise squash an industry. Gentlemen's oh, thank times. you. Gentlemen's time's expired. We want to uh, thank the first panel for their testimony. Um, you may get questions in writing from members as a follow-up. We'd ask if you do to, to respond. Uh, and we do appreciate your testimony. The way, since I had to start this thing so quick so we could get done, the way this, this hearing was set up was to talk to the economists big picture second panel deals with case studies from individuals so uh, that's how this was set up and we appreciate you coming and now we'll uh, ask for the second panel to be seated you won't let me re <laughs> respond We'd like to thank the uh, second uh, panel for uh, joining us. Uh, what I'll do, because I have time, I'm going to introduce you all at one time, and then we'll start from my right to left for the five-minute testimonies. Joining us on the second panel will be have, uh, Leonard F. Hopkins, Fuel Procurement and Compliance Manager from Southern Illinois Power Cooperative, uh, serves for portions of my uh, congressional district, which I said in my opening statement, and we're happy to have you here. Um, Mr. Joseph Baird of the partner in Baird Hansen uh, Limited Liability Partnership. Uh, Ms. Mar Marcia Marcy Kinter, Vice President, Government and Business Information, especially Graphic Imaging Association. We have, uh, not in order, um, uh, Wendy K. New, uh, Executive Vice President, Hugo New Corporation and Chairperson of We Recycle. And uh, last but not least, uh, um, Honorable Vince Ryan, Harris County Attorney. Welcome. And we will start with Mr. Hopkins with your five-minute uh, testimony. Again, your, your entire testimony will be submitted for the record, um, executive summary, uh, uh, within the five minutes as close as possible and uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Leonard Hopkins, as stated, and I serve as the Fuel and Compliance Manager for Southern Illinois Power Cooperative. I am honored to have the privilege to appear before you today. Southern Illinois Power is a generation and transmission cooperative serving approximately 250,000 people and businesses located in the southernmost counties of Illinois. We are a not-for-profit corporation and are owned directly by our members. SIPC operates one power generation station south of Marion, Illinois, 
which utilizes two coal-fired boilers to generate power for its members. When each of these boilers was built, they were equipped with the state-of-the-art pollution control equipment that would allow them to burn Illinois bituminous coal and meet all environmental regulations. We continue to comply with such regulations today. The coal combustion residue regulation being proposed by EPA poses a serious threat <coughs> excuse me, to the economic survival of the cooperative for which I work. While my comments will focus on the effects EPA's decision could have on Southern Illinois power, I believe these comments also reflect the sentiments of many of our nation's electric cooperatives. Southern Illinois Power Cooperative has been utilizing its coal combustion byproducts in beneficial ways for over 20 years. Roof shingle sand, abrasive products, mine reclamation, cement, and fertilizer blends are all examples of ways our coal combustion residues are recycled into beneficial products for society. Southern Illinois Power is concerned that placing the label of hazardous on coal combustion residue will place the same stigma on all coal combustion byproducts and effectively end the possibility of recycling such materials. In the litigious society of today, manufacturers and end users will flee from any recycled product that is remotely related to a hazardous waste. Such an action would remove these recycled products from the marketplace and the recovery of replacement materials would require increased emissions of carbon dioxide and other pollutants. Further, small, virtually unavoidable spills of ash at power plants could be considered illegal disposal of hazardous material and could cause the plant to be in a constant state of noncompliance. Shipments to hazardous waste landfills in the country could increase tenfold as such hazardous waste landfills might be completely filled in only two years. The barriers to compliance associated with such an action could conceivably drive coal-fired power generators like Southern Illinois Power out of business. Southern Illinois Power Cooperative is a small generation and transmission system and defined as a small business by the U.S. Small Business Administration. By regulation, cooperatives are not allowed to maintain large capital reserves. When the cost of running our business suddenly increases like it would under the subtitle C option, we must go directly to our lenders. There is no cash cushion to mitigate these increases, and the cost of new loans would be shared by each co-op member owner in the form of higher electricity rates. SIPC conservatively estimates the subtitle C option would cost its members a minimum of an additional $11 million per year, which is about 25 percent of our current annual fuel budget. And we serve an area of the state that has up to 15 percent unemployment. In cases where small businesses like SIPC are affected, EPA is obliged to pursue the least costly approach in order to mitigate impacts on facilities that can least afford them. Moreover, Congress made clear in enacting the Bevel Amendment under which this decision is being made that EPA should avoid the Subtitle C option if at all possible. Under the Subtitle D option, EPA can promulgate federal regulations specifically designed for CCR disposal units. These regulations would be directly enforceable by the states and the public under RICRA citizen suit provision, and violators would be subject to significant civil, civil penalties. <clears throat> Excuse me. EPA would also retain its imminent and substantial endangerment authority to take action against any CCR units that pose risk to human health or the environment. The D-prime option would enable EPA to establish an environmentally protective program without crippling CCR beneficial use and imposing unnecessary costs on power plants, threatening jobs and increasing electricity costs. In conclusion, Southern Illinois Power agrees with many others who are already on record as opposing the Subtitle C approach. This list includes a bipartisan group of 165 House members and 45 U.S. Senators in the 111th Congress virtually all the states, other federal agencies, municipal, local governments, CCR marketers and beneficial users, unions, and many other third parties who have maintained that regulating CCRs under RICRA's hazardous waste program is simply regulatory overkill and would cripple the CCR beneficial use industry. We respectfully suggest there is no reason to pursue this approach when the subtitled D prime option offers the same degree of protection without the attendant risks and burdens of Subtitle C. 
Thank you again for the opportunity to express the views of a small cooperative regarding a proposed regulation that will have lasting effects on the lives and livelihoods of our members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Uh, now I recognize uh, Mr. Baird for five minutes. Thank you very much. I'm, Let's get your microphone set. That'll help. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm Joe Baird, a uh, partner in Baird Hanson Williams, a mineral resource uh, firm in Boise, Idaho. I'm also president of the Northwest Mining Association. Today I am representing the Idaho Cobalt Project of, of the Formation Capital Corporation U.S. But the problem we now seek to address is not unique to formation. It's a problem for any mining company operating or hoping to operate on uh, federal lands. And uh, by uh, showing up here today, we were hoping to alert the uh, Congress and the executive branch to a developing duplication of a true duplication of environmental uh, uh, regulatory burdens that are already managed by long-standing programs of the BLM and the Forest Service covering exactly the same subject matter and, and uh, covering the same technical issues as an, an EPA regulatory initiative. Now, just quickly, on the Cobalt Project, it's a uh, project that is, is at the end of uh, permitting. And it is, uh, it'll consist of an underground mine and a flotation mill that uses simple physical separation of ore from country rock, eliminating the uh, need to use aggressive chemicals for the milling. Project footprint is only about 135 uh, acres and is located within a traditional cobalt mining district. Uh, uh, and uh, to the extent possible, the project will backfill workings with uh, cemented paste tailings and development rock and use dry stack tailings for surface storage to eliminate the need for a tailings bond. Project will uh, produce about 185 direct jobs, $8.2 million in annual payroll, $8.8 .8 million in uh, taxes annually for a minimum of uh, 10 years, and will importantly be the only source of super alloy cobalt in the U.S. Uh, super alloy grade cobalt is a critical component of all jet engines and many green applications, including hybrid cars, solar cells, and wind turbines. Currently, all U.S. needs <coughs> are met by, by importation primarily from a single foreign company. Uh, Formation is very proud of the fact that the uh, Forest Service approval of the final environmental impact statement has not been challenged. We have uh, written our verbal understandings with the uh, Shoshone Bannock Nations, the Nez Perce Nation, the uh, Idaho Conservation League, Boulder White Clouds Council, Earthworks, and uh, Western Mining Action Project. We were and are grateful for those constructive discussions. Yet even with all of these favorable attributes, the project took seven years to permit, and that is simply, simply too long. But today, we're not even going to try to deal with those permitting issues, but we're trying to head off something uh, coming at us at, or coming at the industry as a whole. Uh, for decades, mines on federal lands have been subject to strict site-specific reclamation financial assurance requirements of the Forest Service or the BLM. The Cobalt Project is on land managed by the Forest Service, but EPA is developing its own financial assurance requirements for all hard rock mines, including those already subject to financial assurances uh, of the BLM and the Forest Service. If EPA proceeds as they are currently uh, planning, it would end up uh, causing financial assurances to be uh, bonded, to be cash bonded, actually, beyond what the Forest Service or the BLM determines is actually needed to protect the environment. This dead capital uh, requirement would unnecessarily force termination of many existing mines, jobs, public and private revenue streams, and hamper creation of new mines supplying strategic and base metals and materials necessary to sustain U.S. manufacturing jobs. <coughs> Implicit in EPA's position is that Forest Service BLM programs are managed so incompetently that as a class, mines on Forest Service or BLM lands constitute a degree and duration of risk that EPA must that, that causes EPA to, be, to must duplicate the long-established Forest Service and BLM programs. Yet in 1999, the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences responding to Congress found that existing Forest Service uh, BLM framework to be, quote, generally effective in protecting uh, the, the environment, and more importantly even for this purpose, quote, 
that, uh, quote, improvements in the implementation of existing regulations present the greatest opportunity for improving environmental protection, meaning that uh, let's work with the existing structure as, as opposed to creating whole new uh, programs out there. So just to uh, wrap up, uh, the Idaho Cobalt Project and many other mines existing in future are critical to the survival and the revival of the U.S. manufacturing sector, which depends on mine products as feedstock. Mining and manufacturing produce some of the best paid jobs and best tax revenue streams in the entire economy. Permitting of hard rock mines in the U.S. is already a long and costly process, particularly when compared to our business competitors in the world. So please don't force us to do the same thing twice with two different departments and end up having to pay reclamation bonds uh, twice over. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Baird. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Ms. Kinter yes. uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Marcy Kinter, and I'm the Vice President of Government and Business Information for the Specialty Graphic Imaging Association, or SGIA. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this afternoon regarding a timely industry concern. Specifically, I'm here today to address a misguided interpretation of the byproducts exemption included in the Toxic Substance Control Act's Inventory Update Law. This proposed interpretation, offered by the EPA Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, will impose a significant reporting burden on the struggling U.S. manufacturing sector without providing additional health, safety, or environmental benefit beyond that already provided under existing EPA and OSHA regulations. It is vital that you remind EPA of congressional intent to exempt most byproducts from the reporting requirements under the TSCA Inventory Update Rule, or IUR. Your interest in this matter is timely, as the rule that I'm here to discuss is currently undergoing interagency review. SGIA represents the interests of those facilities that produce a wide array of products using either the screen printing or digital imaging print platform. Products such as all types of signage, the membrane switch on your microwave oven, the defrost pattern on your car's rear window, to, uh, and we're most known for the message on our t-shirts that we provide to uh, everyone when you're wearing them, that's the industry sector that I represent. Currently, there are over 25,000 screen and digital printing facilities operating in the U.S., and the screen and digital print community is comprised of small businesses. The average facility size ranges from 50 to 40 employees. As you know, the cost of regulatory compliance poses a significantly higher burden on the small business community. The TSCA Inventory Update Rule requires the reporting of extensive data concerning the manufacturing, processing, and use of chemical substances. I am not here today to discuss the benefits or burdens of the entire TSCA Inventory Update Rule. Instead, I would like to focus on a specific aspect, EPA's misinterpretation of the byproduct exemption under the proposed amendments to the IUR. In the proposed rule, EPA's inter misguided interpretation says that waste byproducts generated during the manufacturing of items, like these T-shirts, are new chemicals if the manufacturer does the right thing by sending these waste byproducts for recycling rather than disposing of them. To say we were shocked to discover that the proposed TSCA IUR would have an actual regulatory impact was surprising as we are printers and not chemical manufacturers. While we use chemicals, including inks and solvents, we certainly do not consider ourselves to be chemical manufacturers. At the end of the day, the final product that moves out the door is the printed product, such as this T-shirt, not a chemical product. Under EPA's interpretation, sending our waste byproducts, such as spent solvents and inks for recycling, would be considered by EPA to be the manufacturing of a new chemical for commercial purposes subjecting us to registration and reporting of our waste byproducts under TSCA. Our companies are already regulated by both OSHA for worker exposures as well as US EPA for proper handling and disposal. EPA's misguided interpretation will not only infect those facilities represented by SGIA. Manufacturers of all sorts will now be burdened by reporting their waste byproducts as new chemicals. Every manufacturing sector that has opted to send their waste byproducts out for recycling rather than disposal will be saddled with this record-keeping and reporting burden. There is still time to take action, but we need your help. 
We believe that the interpretation offered by the U.S. EPA regarding the reporting of byproducts is not what Congress intended. The waste byproducts offered by the U.S. product manufacturing community are already regulated by U.S. EPA, and the proposal would only increase the regulatory burden with no discernible environmental benefit. 